Hi everybody, my name is Andre and welcome back to another educational video from Met School EU. Today we're going to be talking about the chemical bond and more specifically we will discuss electronegativity and polarity. First off, what is electronegativity? Well, electronegativity is defined as the ability of an atom to attract an electron pair. And although this is not particularly a periodic trend that we've discussed, but it does follow the same trend or very similar to that of the electron affinity and ionization energy. So if we take a look at the chart and the numbers here typically go anywhere from zero to four. And what this means is that number four would reflect that there's very high electronegativity so the atom has very high ability to attract an electron pair versus zero which would indicate that it has very low chance of attracting an electron pair so its electronegativity would be very low and as you can see the numbers here are structured in this manner so if we're looking at the chart you could see that fluorine is going to be the most electronegative atom or like most electronegative element with 3.98 uh, as the index of electronegativity, whereas something like francium will have a 0 0.7. And we're going to describe why that is. As you can see, the trend goes upward, so it's going to be increasing as we go up, and it's going to be increasing as we move further to the right. Why is the electronegativity increasing? Because if we compare lithium to fluorine, there's a huge electronegativity difference, although they are within the same period. Well, the reason for that is because of the octet rule. An octet rule states that atoms seek to have eight valence electrons. Now, if we take a look here, fluorine has nine, so two in the first shell, seven in the second shell, Therefore, it's only one away from being full octet or satisfying its full octet. Therefore, all it has to do is gain one electron rather than lose seven in order to be stable. So it's either has a choice of losing seven electrons in its outer shell or gaining one. And of course, energetically, it's a lot easier to gain one than to lose seven. So it's going to have a greater ability or greater chance of attracting the electron pair or a single electron for that matter in the case of fluorine whereas lithium lithium has only one electron in its outer shell so one valence electron and one valence electron means in order to satisfy the octet rule it would have to either lose one or gain seven well gaining seven is not going to be realistic so lithium will likely lose an electron rather than gain any electrons so it has a very small tendency to gain electrons simply because it is unlikely to be stable that way it needs to gain a lot of electrons to be stable and that's energetically not feasible so fluorine is going to be the one that has a greater much much greater tendency to gain that electron and as you can see all of these halogens have particularly high electronegativities, especially chlorine and, and uh, fluorine, as they're closer to the right. And of course, that would be excluding the noble gases on this side. And if we're talking about the trend of going up, how come electronegativity increases as you go up, whether it's on the left side or the right side? Both sides are going to be increasing as you go up, non-metal or metal, doesn't matter. Well, the reason for that is specifically something called electron shielding. So electron shielding is the reason we're going to have higher electronegativity as we have less electrons. So as we move up the periodic table, you have less and less electrons. As you move down, you have more and more. And when you have a cluster of electrons around a positive nucleus, so this is going to be our nucleus that's going to be very positive with its protons and uh, neutrons, not really counteracting the positive charge, but it is going to be generally very positive. And you're going to have your electrons that will circle around or get all around the nucleus. 
Now, the more electrons you have around that nucleus, the harder it is for that specific electron to be attracted to the nucleus because this electron has is going to be repulsed by all the other negative electrons that are around. And this is something called electron to electron repulsion. Repulsion is the opposite of attraction. What we have is that electron will not be able to get the influence of the positive charge. So it will not be attracted to the positive charge as much when there's a lot of electrons because it will not be able to reach it. That is going to be shielded by all these other electrons that are around it, which is called electron shielding. So as we get to something like lithium, for example, it only has three electrons. So the electron shielding effect is extremely low. Therefore, it has higher electronegativity than something like francium that has 87 electrons, which has a tremendous amount of positive charges. But it doesn't matter if it has a lot of positive charges because it has a lot of electrons around that are going to shield any new electrons from coming in. Now, the same thing is true on the right side, on the non-metal side. If we're talking about iodine, for example, the reason why iodine has a lower electron electronegativity, despite being completely on the right side as, as fluorine is, is because of electron shielding. It has 53 electrons circling around. They're going to be shielding that positive nucleus from new electrons being attracted, whereas fluorine only has nine. And that makes a tremendous difference in terms of electronegativity. So now that we know how electronegativity is structured, what benefit does it have for us to know this information? And this brings us to polarity. Now, polarity is going to be um, a phenomenon that determines bond type based on electronegativity. So the definition of polarity is that it's a separation of electric charge. Now, in more common terms, if you're going to think about this, think of poles, the North Pole, the South Pole. You've got a compass and a compass is going to show you the North Pole and the South Pole is because there's two opposite ends of attraction. And so if they're separated further out, they're going to be pulling. So the North Pole is pulling and the South Pole is pulling. And they have their own attraction because of their opposite charges and the same is could be applied to our idea of atoms we could have a positively charged atom and we could have a negatively charged atom now if you separate them they're going to have polarity and this is exactly what happens with with bonds so bonds are formed with the idea of polarity being ingrained so the strength of polarity is going to depend on electronegativity difference. So it's going to be the difference in electronegativity between two atoms that will attract each other. So if we're talking about something like sodium and we're talking about chlorine as an example, well, sodium and chlorine are gonna have completely different electronegativities and the difference between them is what's going to create that polarity. So let's take a look at uh, some examples and we're going to determine bond types based on the electronegativity difference. So if our electronegativity difference between the two atoms is anywhere between zero and 0 0.4, then our bond type will be called non-polar covalent. So they're gonna be non-polar, meaning they, they do not have poles. They're not going to be pulling each other. It's not gonna be a tug of war because they have very little difference in that electronegativity. So the electrons will be more or less equally shared between the two. And this is a perfect example uh, with, with something like O2, oxygen gas. So oxygen double bonded to another oxygen with the two lone pair electrons. And as we know from the previous chart that oxygen has the electronegativity of 3.44. Now the oxygen on the left and the oxygen on the right has the same electronegativity. So therefore their difference, their ED, is gonna be zero. And if it's zero, then it falls under this category and it ha has to be nonpolar covalent.
Now the second example is going to be between 0 0.4 and 1.5 as the electronegativity difference that will form a polar covalent bond. And the prime example of this is going to be water. So if we have oxygen bonded to hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen, we know that there's a sharing of electrons between these two, but the sharing will not be equal. The electrons that are shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen are not going to be equally shared because oxygen is going to have higher electronegativity than the hydrogen, which means that oxygen is going to pull those electrons closer to itself. Therefore, it's going to be forming partial charges. So this has, the oxygen has 3.44 as the electronegativity, whereas the hydrogens have 2.2 .2 on each side. So therefore, the electrons that are residing here are going to be closer pulled towards the oxygen because it has a greater tendency to gain those electrons. Now, if we're looking at the difference, the difference is going to be 1.24. If we take 3.44 minus 2.2 is uh, 1.24 is the difference. And that falls right in between this category. And since we have this polar covalent bond, we know that polar covalent bonds are going to form partial charges. So the oxygen will be partially negatively charged because it's going to have those electrons that are shared closer residing to the oxygen, whereas the hydrogens are going to have a slight positive charge because their electrons that are being shared are not close to them. They're going to be more likely to give them up to the oxygen. And they never do actually give them up. They're still shared, but for the majority of the time, they will reside in the presence of the oxygen's nucleus. Now moving on to the final type of electronegativity difference that will form a final now looking now moving on to the final type that will uh, happen at where the electronegativity difference will be 1.5 and up. So anywhere beyond that will have or will form a polar ionic bond. And the prime example of a polar ionic bond is going to be sodium chloride, NaCl. As we've discussed previously, ionic bonds are formed between a metal and a non-metal. And the reason for that is because of their difference in electronegativity. The metals have very low electronegativity. The non-metals have typically high electronegativity. And when you put them together, the difference is going to be great. So in this case, sodium has the electronegativity of 0 0.93, whereas chlorine has the electronegativity of 3.16. Now, when the difference is so great, this is uh, 2.23 is the difference here. Well, when that happens, you're going to form formal charges. So the sodium will actually lose its electron and it will give it to the chlorine and the chlorine will gain the electron because of its much higher electronegativity. So there's no longer a sharing of electrons in ionic bonds. It's a complete transfer of electrons. So this is how we form our bond types using the concepts of polarity and electronegativity. So this concludes our video for today and it concludes our topic on the chemical bond. Check out the next video on inorganic nomenclature.